Welcome to our series in faculty development that we're having. We're looking at ways to help teach us as physicians to be teachers. The focus of the one today is the scholarly osteopathic physician. Who me? Yes, you. Uh, this is a whole series done in osteopathic academic and faculty development that's part of an initiative called Training Osteopathic Primary Care Educators. We're going to kind of go through today and we'll look at different strategies. This session is really geared towards you, your development, your growth. It's going to be rather interactive and we're going to pause at different times for you to reflect of. on the website with ACOM and if you don't have it, just take out a piece of paper and jot down some ideas. You don't have to write a full thesis on this, but maybe a few ideas on each area you go through. So we're going to stop through this. I want you to stop and really get the most out of this here. Identify things and scholarly activities which will help you reach your goals and develop something called a portfolio. We want to look at different approaches themselves that pursuing them on ideas that advance osteopathic concepts. As a profession, it's unique to us, and we should find methods to do that. And then I think look at specific opportunities for yourself in advance that look at the osteopathic physician and the osteopathic organizations. And there's areas within our profession that are really waiting for you to take advantage of. So again, the introduction, we're going through this, we're going to focus on this career analysis. We'll look at a whole series of scholarship components we have. We'll make a strategic plan for yourself. We'll look at different opportunities in the organization, and then we'll come towards the end. But the first thing we have to do is, what's a portfolio? Well, I think we, we see the portfolio in front of us, and in, in your own mind, you know, when you think of portfolio, think for a moment of what things do you think when you say the word portfolio? I think this picture summarizes quite a bit of it. Because here we've got someone holding on, we think of the world of art. And art really established portfolio, and more made portfolio something that is you know, part of demonstrating all the works they've had. In medical education, this is something that has been using it uh, now and it is looking at it as a context of, you know, people say, well, is this just my CV? Well, it's more than your CV. It's looking at all of aspects of you as a physician and professionally, but also are you doing other things? Poetry, developing things, developing as an individual. This whole collection is important. And right now in the AOA programs, ACGME programs, it's a very hot item. We want to see developing these portfolios for our learners to see their well-developed educators. So the next question is, what is scholarly activity? So I'd like to take a moment for you to pause and to look at this and think in your own mind, what is scholarly activity in your mind? When we take a moment to look at this, a standard definition is the academic pursuits that serves either the specialty or the profession and or involve creative intellectual work that is peer reviewed and publicly disseminated. And if you think of that, it has a lot of areas that have an impact in going through it. It's getting that contribution. When you think of scholarly activity, what examples of your scholarly activity? So we'll take a moment for you to also look at yourself and say, what examples am I doing now of scholarly activity? When you look at yourself, some things maybe that come to mind is there are general types that you can have for scholarly activity. And we'll go in more detail with this, but just overall, we have major and minor things that are involved. Major, think of this as something at a national level or regional or state that have more of a greater impact in doing it. Minors, you're getting credit for this, but it may not have the same level of impact. So in a major, maybe it's part of a major committee, you can present a publication or case reports. Maybe you're helping with the board certifying exam. Minor things, maybe you're helping with the resident in training exam. You're helping with projects that are in progress. They're not done, but you've done work on it. You deserve credit for it. Maybe you're publishing something, but it's not in a peer-reviewed journal, but it's out there and going through it. So again, there's major and minor things, and we're going to go through these more uh, very soon. Well, when you go through this stuff, you say, oh gosh, it's called activity. This makes me crazy. I don't think I can do all this stuff. Well, where do I begin doing these things? So, hence the question mark, where do I begin? But the first question would be, why do this? So, again, take a moment. Look at yourself and say, why would I want to do this? When you look at that and critically yourself, why would you want to do scholarly activity, maybe it's a simplifying it. I'm just saying to make a difference. It's something to make a difference for yourself personally, 
and also professionally and going through that because most of us doing this, this is not something we can do easily between nine and five during the day. Or as physician types, really, I say seven to seven during the day, going through things. Maybe the first step is we should do a self-reflection. Look at ourself. Where have I been? Where am I now? Where am I going? You look at where you've been. What academic activities have I done thus far? Where am I at now? Am I doing things that I really want to do? Where are you going? Maybe you have some idea where you'd like to be and what do you need to do to meet those long-term goals going through it? Well, the first step, I'd like to do a career analysis. This is not right or wrong. <laughs> this is you looking at yourself and being very honest with that and determining that. I'd like to give you some time, and we're going to answer some questions. On the webpage with ACOM, they should have a form to fill out. And you can use that, but again, just take out a pad and paper if you want to. And look at these questions here and answer them very honestly. You don't have to write paragraphs or a thesis again, just maybe a few ideas or a few lines with it. Are you happy with your current professional position? Why? You know, why not? Next question would be, is this where you see yourself at the peak of your career? And understand, a peak does not mean one peak. It could be multiple peaks of different things that you're getting, but where do you see those points in career and going through it? Maybe the one to even think about is, where would you like to be in your ideal professional position? So let's take a moment, look at things, put this on pause, look at those questions, jot down a few ideas that look at yourself, the peak, and that ideal position. I hope you've had a chance to take a look at these questions, looking at yourself and your career, looking at how you feel about your current position, if you're happy there, where you see yourself at a peak or different peaks in your career, and what would be your ideal uh, position. So it's very important, and this is very helpful, especially in a, in a group setting, to maybe share with another colleague some of these ideas and to go through and think, you know, you know, how you're feeling in these stages themselves and, you know, how, getting their perspective. And that's very valuable. So taking a moment to do this and do this with a group of a few other physicians that are also in this kind of quest and looking at things uh, may be helpful as well. Yes, I'm making you work. And we got some more things. So let's go to the next thing. It's when we're trying to look at developing a career, we have to look at ourselves in the short run and the long run. So to do this, look at yourself today and now see what would you like to see yourself in a year? Let's not put it too far out there. In one year from today, where do you see, and maybe you said, I'll just be the same as I'm at, maybe there's other things you'd like, but in just one year time, where do you see yourself? To complement that, look at yourself in five to 10 years and see where would you like to see yourself in five to 10 years? Let's give ourselves a little bit of time again you can use the form we have on the website with ACOM or just take out that pad and paper and jot down a few ideas of thinking where you see yourself in a year and then again the next five to ten years. Now that you have a chance to kind of reflect on your short and long-term goals of where you see yourself in one year and the next five to ten years, this is an ideal one to share with a colleague. And they may also go through this to look and see how you both feel about where things are at within a year, and again, five to 10 years. And this, I think, helps us kind of focus where we're at. So, okay, we've got all these goals. How do I get these goals? So that thing self. Well, kind of a lead into what we're talking about, scholar activity, because it's a key thing that can help you get from point A to point B. What's the benefit here? Well. Most people are involved in some teaching you'd like to be, this is a requirement. It's necessary for going for promotion if you're in an academic center. Career advancement. I think though it's really important to make it personally something that you want to develop yourself as a physician and also develop yourself as an educator. It does add a lot more satisfaction in going through it and it comes back to that making a difference thing. 
if you look at some studies, and this one was published um, itself in family medicine, and it looked at faculty and said, how do I know which residents are successful in doing scholar activity? Well, I think that's that mentorship thing. It's where people have been mentored that they've had a chance. This study was really interesting. They looked, they found that if they had over 25% of the residents were publishing within two years, if they had a few factors, the program director, so the guy leading them, was publishing. A number of faculty were publishing, and also they found that programs that were more well established. You know, for example, they said at Residency Open before 1980. So it's a very well established program where newer programs maybe have more fundamental things to work on, established program. But then they looked at even over half the residents involved in it. If you have other things, you recognize uh, themselves uh, for their, your scholarship. Uh, we have an annual research uh, symposium each year, and it gives a goal for things to do it, and it, it does help. First is that given dedicated time. Sometimes you feel that's really hard. One thing we do is we have a half day of didactics. We acknowledge that there's uh, one or two hours a week that is put on for personal scholarly time. So when they come back to me and said, oh, I just didn't get time to do this, I said, look, we've given you one or two hours this whole year. You've got 50 to 100 hours put aside for you. Kind of lays those excuses off to the side. There's other researchers day that can occur themselves. Academic advancement is linked to scholarship, and I think really stressing how this can make a difference in going through it. But also, it comes to leadership. You want the person leading it to do themselves, be involved in it, and helping uh, to make it happen. Uh, the American College of Osteopathic Emergency Room Physicians, honestly, is one of the specialty colleges that has, I think, done a really good job of identifying what things they want. And they're one of the few specialties that has really laid out specific criteria for faculty. And they wanted to show that this is not someone resting on their laurels. They want things to have occurred in the last four years. They look at major and minor activities, and they want to see two majors or one major and two minor scholarly activities for their core faculty. They may look at other things with it themselves, but they want to make sure that you're, you're also very specific in when you're doing these things. So let's take a moment, let's just review some of the major scholarly activities. Break them into different areas. The first revolves around service, and usually it's a national, uh, regional, or state level. You may serve on a committee. Maybe you're head of the committee or you're vice chair of that committee or your active member. Committee work is not just sitting there and you know, just sitting in meetings. It's honestly doing things. And I think recognizing that contribution is scholar activity. If there's a journal and you're a member of an editorial review board, there's some work with that and going through it. Acknowledge that that is major scholar activity. You're making a significant difference. This is when people look at presentation publications. Some people, the only thing they see is scholar activity is you're writing peer reviewed journals. Well, that's part of it, but again, it's not the only thing. Again, case reports, clinical series, professional scientific meetings, conferences, you're, you're presenting those things. Uh, CME seminars, CME involves a little bit more stringent oversight in looking at that. If you look at original research or review articles in peer-reviewed journals, or a chapter in a medical textbook, the chapters are also re reviewed and reviewed by you know, the editors. Those things do require uh, more scrutiny. And they're a major activity. The other involvement in doing things at national level or even at your site is, unless you've got grant funding for something you're doing, um, that shows that you're you know, obviously had to go through the extra steps. You've got to get extra IRB training, acknowledging that for educational or service research. If your certifying board has an opportunity for you to be item writing, the National Board of Osteo Medical Examiners has a formal training course they'll put people through to help and really give you some skill sets for that. So if you're thinking of that, it's a great avenue to help you out with that. Minor things, similar, similar presentations, publications. This may be you know, not at the national meeting, but maybe a visiting professorship. Maybe there's the other residency across town that you're part of. Some places will give you credit for things you're giving within your own program. Most are looking for you stepping outside of that uh, for themselves. Let's say you publish something, you write a chapter, and it's not in a peer-reviewed journal. Well, it still takes work to do, and that's an avenue to get credit for as well. Maybe if you go to one of the national meetings, and they said, hey, would you mind serving as a judge? That's a great experience, because a lot of times you get check sheets, and they'll show you different things that you can pick out. And you can think to yourself, wow, I didn't realize how many points you can get for this, and I, oh, I, I never thought of putting an institutional emblem on this or acknowledging the IRB approved this. You know, you learn things from doing that stuff. And that's a very simple thing, because it may take several hours, but you can learn a lot and bring that back to you. Let's say you put a research project into IRB, but it's, you know, it's, it's being considered, you know, or it's been approved, you're getting data, you get credit for that. You know? um, if you're putting a grant application request, 
ton of work. Maybe you didn't get it, but showing you've done it, that's a minor. Most specialty colleges are really excited if anyone write in training exam questions because it's tough getting them. Again, the National Board of Osteo Medical Examiners has some training for the specialty boards, but also there's opportunities to help with that. And that takes time. You have to write questions. You have to write it you know, well. You've got to reference it. You've got to give uh, references and explain why it's right and why it's wrong. So it does take time. The next activity I want to people through is, this is not a look at yourself. Cannot write, not wrong. What kind of scholar activity are you, is your personal interest? So the next sheet is looking at it. I've gone through these things. And if you don't have it, you can kind of look back at what I've identified as major and minor things. And honestly, ask yourself this. In the uh, kind of the whole workbook I have for you out there, I put the interest of participation. None. You don't. No way. Little. Possible. Absolutely. So in other words, you know, but be honest with yourself, if you looked at all these major and minor things and looked at all those categories, multiple categories, you don't have to do everything, but just pick things you like and see yourself again. No interest, little, possibly, or absolutely interested in doing that. So it will take a little while for you to take some time to review those major and minor areas. So I hope your look at the major and minor activities, able to find some things that you're interested in. If everything is done, well, it will be a challenging lecture. But anyway, other than that, hopefully, you know, there's some things you find that you honestly like out of going through this. And you don't have to do all these. Well, I don't want to get in front of all these people. You don't have to. There's other things to do that you can go as well. But look at themselves and let's gather some thoughts, develop strategies. You want to develop your academic portfolio. You want to look at where you want to be in the end. These activities are very important for that. You can also look at the lecture on academic survival that Dr. Paul Evans has given. That's also part of things. And all the things they expect of you, these are the keys to get you to that point and going through it. So when we go through this, I also have to put a major plug. Um, as osteopathic physicians, Doing things that advance osteopathic concepts should be something that we give a priority to, things that we've done. And the work that we have in how we're training people and developing scholar activity, it's an avenue that's unique to us. It's an avenue that our other counterparts cannot you know, comment on. We have the content knowledge of this. It's part of our heritage. So I strongly encourage you, when you think of scholar activity, do some things that honestly advance osteopathic concepts in doing that. So now we're going to go through kind of our final activity. And again, our hope is to develop the scholar activity. So let's make a game plan. If you don't create you know, a plan, then your plan is not to succeed. So let's go through this. Let's begin. And let's look at three different categories. And this is the last page of the handout we have. And again, if you don't have a handout, uh, fine. Take out that uh, a piece of paper. And let's make different areas. Three months, six months, and 12 months. In each of these areas, our goal is pointing to be is we want in a year for us to develop ourselves as a scholarly osteopathic physician. And we have to set that up. There are multiple major and minor scholarly activities. Look at the list of things you said that absolutely want to do. And then the next thing is possibly. And pick at least to have, ideally, either two major or one major and two minor, that over the course of a year, you can get done. In each of these areas, you want to create the strategy to doing it. Let's look at three months. What's one activity you complete in the next three months? Let's acknowledge the barriers to preventing that, to getting to that, and what are solutions to meet that goal? So let's take a few minutes. Let's look at just three months from now what we can do. So now you've looked at that three-month period, looking at one activity you can try to compete in the next three months and do that. You've seen some of the barriers, and you've created some solutions for it. So now we're going to the next phase. Let's go out to six months. What's one activity you can complete over the next six months? What are barriers to getting that one done? And what are some solutions to overseeing that goal? Let's take a few minutes, put some pause, 
write those ideas out so we can accomplish. So now we've looked at our six month plan to see an activity complete in the six months, what are barriers to that, and some solutions. Let's go to the final phase. It's 12 months out. What's one thing we can make sure we get done within 12 months? And what are those barriers to doing that? And what are some solutions to meeting that 12 month goal? Tim, take a few minutes write out that thing you'd like to do over 12 months. So now you've kind of acknowledged over three months, over six months, and over 12 months, different activities that you'll have over the next year of the whole list of major minor scholar activities. So this is an ideal one to sit down again with a colleague and review your list. Look at things you want to do at each of these intervals. And be honest about it. If you're just finishing a fellowship and you're getting out in practice, you say, you know, in three months, I just want to get myself established. You know what? Give yourself a break, be realistic. Honestly, I'm having a baby in two months. I think that's going to be a little while. That's fine. Put your realities out there, what you're doing, but be realistic. But the goal is at the end of this year, find ways to make these things happen. And to meet that, you know, who, the how, the what, the where. You know, look at those kind of questions around it to make those things happen. I'll give a fast example of things. If you're involved with the American Academy of Osteopathy or any other organization, they have opportunities for committee or chair work. If you involve with that, they'll make you a program chair. Sometimes it's one of those situations where everyone's standing in line, everyone steps back, and you're there. That happens, uh, and remember that a lot. So, but you can get these things, too. Even have a chance if you get to know the group, say, I'd like to present. There's opportunities to present and going through that. Getting in training exams uh, for their, the group there, they love to have people putting in an MOMM board exam questions. When you get that certifying board, that may take a little bit more training, and that's where the National Board of Osteo Medical Examiners has some formal training, and it's a great resource. They have their own journal. Many special colleges have their own journal. The American Academy of Osteopathy's journal is looking for contributions. Um, poster judge at their contest, you know, say, I know that they're having your posters to their contest. Could I be a, a judge for that? This is a three-hour activity, but you'll learn a lot from it, and it counts towards getting that activity. They also have a special area called a fellow of the American Academy of Osteopathy. This is a process, if you're bored in that area, that you can also develop things, you know, to meet that level. A lot of these fellowship programs, if you go through the process, you'll get a lot of activities out of that. They wanted people to be a member of their organization for five years, be certified by an AOA board. They want to have CME credits as part of it. They also make sure people have specific time practice. In this one, they only have three years. They create categories of service, and I'll go through that in a moment, and they have seven areas. They want to see that you show something in four. They want to see you have an outline of a thesis and they make sure you adhere to a code of ethics. And with this program, they have a two-year process for it. So when they put out their seven categories, I said, are you contributing to the osteopathic literature? Are you developing something in osteopathic theory and practice? Are you doing any kind of research that's involved in expanding that? Are you doing, with involved in education? Are you teaching? Are you giving a class, giving a lecture? Are you involved in any of the organizations within the academy? Are you helping with public relations? Well, gee, I gave it, you know, they asked me to do some uh, thing with a local TV station. That's a public activity. You're getting credit for that as a service. Are you doing some administrative service to the profession? Well, I'm an assistant program director somewhere. That counts. That's part of that service. You may realize that a lot of things you're doing really count as scholar activity. When they do the FAO process, they meet between a committee. They have to show three cases. It used to be 10 required uh, back in the day when I went through it, but that's okay. They wanted three because they wanted people to spend more time on the thesis. And they suggested it might be nice to have one of the cases reflect their thesis. And also, you may lead to some of some publishable paper. And over two years, you think, well, I could do a lot of stuff. Really, you have to be more realistic on all the things you can complete. And at the end of it, you have an oral and practical examination. So uh, for the FAO process, uh, Judy O'Connell's uh, head of the, the group with that, and she honestly put a plea out to folks to do those extra levels and say to move up to become an FAO. But I'm also putting out to you as becoming an osteopathic physician who has some things scarly. It's time. It's time for you to look at that. It's time to go to the next level yourself professionally and personally 
and to make that happen. So what do we do? We looked at different strategies. We found ways to develop as an academic osteopathic physician. We looked at specific scholarly activities that may enhance that portfolio for yourself. And they'll and lead to a lifetime more satisfaction meeting those goals. We looked at approaches also thinking of things that can enhance the osteopathic concept. Uh, and that's very important. And look at different organizations. We use examples of the American Academy of Osteopathy. But you look at any specialty college with the American College of Osteopathy Family Physicians, the American Academy, you know, uh, you know, the uh, pediatric group, uh, OB group, all the groups have opportunities to do that. Work with them, and they'll help you along that way. Uh, and in dollars of our references, we've had a lot of good resources, and uh, hopefully this will spur you on because it's time.